Good day to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, we're going to be doing lesson four, and we're going to be doing this on Job's chapter three through five. So, as always, let us begin in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the week that you gave us. Uh, we thank you for the fact that no matter what problems arose, you were always there to guide us, to lead us. And Father, as we're doing this study, help us learn that we can depend on you, that we can trust you, that you love us, that you have a plan for us, and that you are always there with us, Lord. And we're very grateful for that. And uh, we would just hope that you take this message and apply it to our hearts and our daily walk. Amen. So before uh, we uh, started learning Job on suffering, and as we continue here, uh, a lot of this lesson will be on that too. Uh, Job thinks he's dying, and uh, we want to read all of chapter 3. After Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth, and Job said, Let the day perish on which I was to be born, and the night which said, A boy is conceived. May that day be darkness. Let not God above cure for it, nor light shine on it. Let darkness and black gloom claim it. Let a cloud settle on it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. As for that night, let darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Behold, let that night be barren. Let no joyful shout enter it. Let those curse it who curse the day. We are prepared to rouse Leviathan. Let the stars of its twilights be darkened. Let it wait for the light but have none. Let it not see the breaking dawn, because it did not shut the opening of my mother's womb or hide trouble from my eyes. Why did I not die at birth? Come forth from the womb and it expire. Why did the knees receive me? Why the breasts that I should suck? For now I would have lain down and been quiet. I would have slept and then I would have been at rest with kings and with counselors of the earth, who rebuilt urns for themselves, or with princes who had gold, who were filling their houses with silver, or like a miscarriage which is discarded, I would not be as infants that never saw light. There the wicked cease from raging, and there they are at rest. The prisoners are at ease together. They do not hear the voice of the taskmaster. The small and the great are there, and the slave is free from his master. Why is light given to him who suffers, and life to the bitter of soul, who long for death but there is none, and dig for it more than hidden treasures, who rejoice greatly and exalt when they find the grave? Why is light given to man whose way is hidden, and whom God has hedged in. For my groanings come at the sight of my food, and my cries pour out like water. For what I fear has come up on me, and what I dread befalls me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet, and I am not at rest, but turmoil comes. So Job here, after a week of sitting still, has opened up speech. And the first thing he says is that he's dying and he curses the day of his birth, his very existence. He actually says it would be better to die. Uh, and I will admit that it's easier to die for Christ than to live for him. Just throw that tidbit in there. Uh, but Job now is actually questioning God's goodness, his love, his judgments. Satan has whispered in his ear, as we heard in the previous chapter, uh, doubt. And he's put uh, doubt that God loves Job enough. And now Job has started to doubt God's goodness. He's fearing if God loves him enough to come and save him. 
and he's eyeing death as an escape. And many people in life, when they get in a hopeless situation, they end up committing or trying to commit suicide. And that's one of the reasons I express or stress that the importance of having a personal relationship with Christ, because all believers have hope. With Christ, there's always hope. And um, Job's a believer. So I have to ask here, what has changed? I lost my picture. What's that? Oh, I'm going to have to get some technical help here. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, so I have to ask, what has changed here? Okay, so we went through Job questioning God's goodness. And a week earlier... Job has not one, but two confessions of faith. And so now he's went from his confession of faith to looking to death and regretting his birth. So what's our enemy that has come up? Well, our third enemy in suffering is time. And the problem is time changes us. We grow impatient. Our doubt increases. Our faith weakens. And it's actually, I would liken it to a farmer who throws crops out. And when he throws the crops, he's very excited and he's expecting a good crop. And they start to grow and everything's going good and he has a lot of faith. But then the drought comes and he starts praying for rain. And he's got faith that God's going to come and save him and as time goes by and the drought doesn't go away, he looks out and he sees his crops dying, withering, and he gives up. He stops praying and he says, it, it's all going to waste because his faith has weakened and doubt has come in because his, that's what his eyes see. But we have to be stronger than that. We have to understand that God is immutable because our emotions fluctuate. At times we're strong, at times we're weak. But Hebrews 13.8 says, God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So although our emotions fluctuate, God never changes. And God uses our adversity to show us our lack of faith so that we can uh, grow it or increase it. Shows us our need for him so that we cling to him tighter. Uh, so that he shows us his faithfulness and his love towards us. And he shows us his wisdom, his way, his answer, and his plan. When God comes and saves us or rescues us, it's by his plan for Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my way. My way is higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. We also see in Isaiah 40, The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. And inscrutable means impossible to interpret or understand because ultimately God is uncomprehensible. We don't understand uh, what he's doing a lot of times. So that according to Habakkuk 2.4, we live by faith. The just live by faith. We have to trust him. But the lesson here and what God um, is trying to show us a lot is that he does things in his timing and in his way. Uh, God's solution is often something we never ever not only comprehend, we don't even dream or think of it sometimes. And I think of a couple of instances in the Bible. First, in Genesis 50, uh, when Joseph is at the end of the life, 
he's talking to his brothers, and he says, this evil that has come on me, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And Joseph, if you'll remember the story, his brothers took him and threw him in the well and ended up uh, selling him, took his clothing, dipped it in blood, and told his father he was dead. But even though Joseph went through a lot at the end, God saved the nation of Israel through Joseph, through bringing that about. Uh, also, I think, you know, uh, God created the world in seven days, and he rested on the eighth. Now, God could have created the world in a split second. He has that power, but he didn't. Uh, also, God, when he rested, was not tired. He wasn't wore out. That isn't why he rested. The reason he took seven days and rested is he showed us a pattern for how we're to live. And that's why he brought that about. So that we have a pattern that we know that we are supposed to work seven, um, we are supposed to work, sorry, six days, rest on the seventh. I said that wrong. Uh, but that we are to have a day of rest and worship of him. So we could not have even think of something like that in our lives. But God alone is uncomprehensible. And if you'll remember last week's lesson, we learned that he's in control of everything that happens. There are no loose atoms. God doesn't passively react to something. If, say, that um, you had a small child, and uh, I hope this never happens, but say you have a small child, and it runs in the road, and it gets run over. God is not passively allowing that to happen. He has ordained that because he has a plan that me and you can't see. So that is a time that we have to depend and trust on him. But what do we do when adversity falls on us? Who do we turn to and who do we go to? Most of us, we turn to our friends, our family, our own wisdom. And we do that because a lot of times we don't trust God enough to go with his plan. We doubt that he's going to give us the answer we want. Few of us turn to God first and prayer first, and that's what we need to learn to do, all of us. This, this lesson applies to me. Uh, God's sovereign. He's omnipotent. He's omnipotent. He's in 100% control of everything. So why would we not go to God first? Okay, the reason uh, God does this is he wants to show us his love that he has for us as, as we act. But he waits for us to go to him in prayer to express our need of him, our trust of him, and our love of him. And this is one of his promises that I want to read out of Isaiah 40, 29 through 31. He gives strength to the weary. To him who lacks, he lacks might. He increases power. Through youth grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men will stumble badly. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Those are awesome promises that God gives us uh, as we call up on him. And he does this, in my opinion, to show that he loves us, to tell us, I love you. He doesn't love us because we deserve it. We don't deserve it. But because he chose to, for his own reasons, which, unfortunately, are uncomprehensible to us. We will never understand why he does to us what he does, why he's so good to us. Uh, now I want to read, in response here, Eliphaz comes into the picture. And we're going to read chapter 4. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered, 
If one ventures a word with you, will you become impatient? Who can refrain from speaking? Behold, you have admonished many, and you have strengthened weak hands. Your words have helped the tottering to stand, and you have strengthened the feeble knees. But now it has come up on you, and you are impatient. It touches you, and you are dismayed. It is not your fear of God, your confidence, and the integrity of your ways, your hope. Remember now, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the upright destroyed? According to what I have seen, those who plow iniquity and those who sow trouble harvest it. By the breath of God they perish, and by the blast of his anger they come to an end. The roaring of the lion and the voice of the fierce lion and the teeth of the young lions are broken. The lions perish for lack of prey, and the whelps of the lions, lionesses, are shattered. Now a word was brought to me steadily, and my ear received a whisper of it, a mist disquieting thoughts from the visions of the night. When the deep sleep falls on man, dread came upon me and trembling, and made my bones shake, and then a spirit passed by my face. The hair of my flesh bristled up. It stood still, but I could not discern its appearance. A form was before my eyes. There was silence. Then I heard a voice. Can a man be just before God? Can a man be pure before his maker? He puts no trust even in his servants, and again his angels he charges error. How much more are those who dwell in the house of clay, whose foundations in the dust, who are crushed before the moth. Between morning and evening they are broken in pieces. Unobserved they perish forever. Is not their tent cord plugged up within them? They die yet without wisdom. So what we see here happening is, is in the beginning Eliphaz is telling Job I lost my place. Eliphaz is telling Job that you reap what you sow. Uh, that Job was righteous at the beginning, but now adversity has fallen on him, and it hasn't fallen out of anywhere, but God is punishing Job because he's a hypocrite, and in verse 8, uh, he actually says, according to what I have seen, those who plow in equity and those who sow trouble harvest it. In other words, you reap what you sow. Uh, you've brought this all on yourself. So what's lacking here? Well, to me, it's compassion. That Eliphaz is all over Job, but he doesn't say anything like, well, God bless you, uh, or may God forgive you, or I'll pray with you. A matter of fact, throughout this, Job is the only one that's praying to God. The three friends never once. They have a lot of uh, hypocrisy, and uh, I want to go into what's driving Eliphaz here. Ah. Uh. Okay, so the night spirit, okay, he, he, no one questions Eliphaz's night spirit. Well, the night spirit comes and whispers in his ear. Uh, in verse 13, it says he brought disquieting thoughts and visions. On verse 14, it says he causes dread, trembling, his bones to shake. On 15 and 16, it says he appeared as a scary form and spoke to him. And what does he say? What does he tell Eliphaz? He says that man cannot be blameless, as Job claims. That man is dust to be crushed, to be broken to pieces, to be destroyed, and to be perished without wisdom. This is Satan. Okay? This is a corruption of the Word of God. This is a corruption... Uh, oh, we believe that, that we're sinners, but we do not believe 
that God desires to crush us. Uh, matter of fact, God loves us. He's made a plan of redemption for us. And the depravity of man, Satan has taken this and trying to show that we are just worms to be destroyed. And Eliphaz and also his three friends are going with this. Satan is in the background. He's using them to get at Job. And that's, that's what we see happening here. So we know that Satan's trying to destroy him. We know that Satan wants to destroy us. He's the number one enemy we have to face, and he's the source of all evil. But, I love the word but, but God is molding us into a better vessel, bringing us into a deeper relationship with ourselves, or with himself. And that's what he's doing uh, with Job as we go through here, is the, the suffering that Job is going through is not random. It did not just fall out of the sky, okay? God ordains everything. There is nothing that happens by chance, and you have to learn this lesson because so often many of us today think that God acts passively or he's not in total control. God is in total control of everything at all times. If he is not in total control of everything at all times, then he's not God, <laughs> okay? God is, doesn't have a second that he doesn't know what's going to happen, that he did not predestine what's going to happen. And because of that, everything is going to work out for good in the end. God is not putting people in situations just to punish them. He'll have a day he does that. But in this life, God is trying to bring us to him. He's trying to bring us into deeper relationships with him. He's trying to teach us things that we need so that we can grow, so that we can be more on the same page that he is. He ordains everything in our life for our good. Nothing happens to us that ultimately is going to end out bad we are going to learn some kind of lesson from everything that happens. Okay, we're going to look. Eliphaz continues in 5. Call now, is there anyone who will answer you? And to which of the holy ones will you turn? For anger slays the foolish man, and jealousy kills the simple. I have seen the foolish taking root, and cursed his abode immediately. His sons are far from safety. They are even oppressed in the gate. There is no deliverer. His harvest the hungry devour and take it to the place of thorns. And the schemer is eager for wealth. For affliction does not come from the dust, nor does trouble sprout from the ground. For a man is born for trouble, as sparks fly upward. But as for me, I would seek God, and I would place my cause before God who does great and unsearchable things and wonders without number. He gives rain on the earth and sends water on the fields so that those set on high, so that he sets on high those who are lowly and those who mourn are lifted to safely. He frustrates the plotting of the shrewd so that their hands cannot attain success. He catches the wise by their own shrewdness and the advance of the cunning is quickly thwarted. By day they meet with darkness and grope at night in the and grope at noon as in the night. But he saves from the sword of their mouth, and the pow, the poor from the hand of the mighty. So the helpless has hope, and the uprightness must shut his mouth. Behold. How happy is a man whom God reproves. So do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. For he inflicts pain and gives relief. He wounds and his hands also heal. From six troubles he will deliver you. Even in the seven evils will not touch you. In famine he will redeem you from death. And in war from the power of the sword. 
You will be hidden from the scourge of the tongue, and you will not be afraid when violence, when it comes. You will laugh at violence and the famine. You will not be afraid of wild beasts, for you will be in league with the stones of the field, and the beasts of the fields will be at peace with you. You will know that your tent is secure, for you will visit your abode and fear no loss. You will know also that your descendants will be many and your offspring as the grass of the earth. You will come to the grave in full vigor like the stacking of grain in its season. Behold this. We have investigated it and so it is. Here it is. And know for yourself. Well... Okay, so one of the questions here at the very beginning in verse 1, Eliphaz asked Job, which holy one will you call on, or who will you serve? And to me, only Satan is asking a question like that. Eliphaz talks of cursing the foolish um, and the simple and how evil befalls them, and all of these are not words of comfort. And... He says in uh, 6 through 7 that Job isn't suffering for no reason and not without cause, but God clearly has said that uh, Job is blameless and that's not the cause of his suffering. So he also in verse 4 says his sons are far from safety, implying that uh, Job's sons were guilty or deserving of death. So this is not a this is not a message of encouragement. <laughs> not going to get through technical problems here. I can see that. Uh, and one thing we want to see here uh, is on the the night visions. There are some people today and some religions today that still uh, talk or use uh, visions or secret uh, messages or uh, something besides the scripture. And since the, uh, the apostles have left us, God has left his word, the Bible. And no matter where we learn anything, whatever the source, it has to be say what the Bible says. Uh, Paul says that if even an angel, and he says this in Galatians 1, um, 6 through 10, when he's talking uh, about perverting God's truth, that even if an angel should come down and bring another message, a different gospel, that we should reject it. Because the scripture is what we believe. It's the holy word of God. It's how he talks to us now. He doesn't talk to us vocally. He, there are no secret languages to learn. It's all in Scripture. He's laid it out for us to see, to learn, to study. So whatever you believe, whatever that you hear, it has to line up with Scripture. And God uses what I call two witnesses. He doesn't have a place where there's a verse that means something and it's never found again in the Bible. You will always find another verse to back it up. And that's how you know you're on the truth because a lot of people have taken a scripture and corrupted it. You can't do that when you take more than one scripture and put them together and see the picture that God wants you to see. Uh, but Job knows this. Job knows that God's wiser than us, that God will not be manipulated. He still knows that God's in control. And he also knows that he's not blameless and that his suffering is not due to unrighteousness. The f three friends keep pointing to him and telling him, you reap what you sow, you're guilty, that's why you're suffering. You can see God's punishing you, and so you are a hypocrite, and that's not true. But God is omnipotent, he's omnipotent, and he's uncomprehensible. And so he sees and knows everything. He's all-powerful to control everything. And he has a plan that no one but him can actually know from beginning to finish.
And this is what I was talking about, the false prophets, that uh, their word will not line up with Scripture. They will come with a message that will not be found in the word of God. God reveals himself to us today through his word. Scripture alone, that's the way that he has chosen. That's the source that he's used. And actually, we have the five solos. I'm going to get us there. I am having some technical difficulties today with my clicker. Got a, it's got a timer thing that I don't have down. Y'all pray for me. <laughs> well, anyway, Scripture alone, by Christ alone, through faith alone, for God's glory alone. And that's, that's a message I really wanted y'all to see. Give me one second here, and then we'll close this up. Scripture alone, grace alone, through faith alone, by Christ alone, for God's glory alone. And I know that I've kind of drummed that. There we go. I've kind of, I'm trying to drum that into y'all's head, but, but that really is the important thing that I want y'all to take, that only trust God's Word, okay? That's the source, Scripture alone. And as Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, we're saved by grace, grace alone, through faith, faith alone, and that faith is actually a gift from God, so no one can boast. So all of that is for Christ alone. He's the one that saves us. His name is the only name, and all of it is for God's glory alone. And uh, that's the message I want to bring, and uh, thank y'all for bearing with me. And we're going to close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I know we had a lot of technical difficulties, but I know that you can put your message in the hearts that you want to. And Father, help people learn that you are the hope, that you are the anchor, that we can always count on your faithfulness, even though we can't count on ourselves, and we can't count on faithfulness from any other source, that there's always hope with you, that there's always joy and comfort with you, that no matter where we find ourselves, whatever circumstance, you will pull us through that, and you will bring us into your loving arms, and you will make everything work out for our good. And we, in return, want to learn to praise you, to come to you, to pray to you, and to bring all the glory to you and to your Son, Jesus Christ, who did so much for us. Amen. Mm -hmm.